Hello, uh, my name is Colin Strong. I'm Head of Behavioural Science at Ipsos, and it is my real pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Camilla Pang, who is the author of the book Explaining Humans and What Science Can Teach Us About Life, Love and Relationships. Um, been a really well received book, um, winning the uh, 2020 uh, Royal Society Investment Insight Investment Science Book Award. Um, so uh, it's, it's it's going down a storm. So uh, great to have you here at the conference, Camilla. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me on here. This is um, <laughs> going to be an interesting conversation. So it looks as if things have been a bit of a whirlwind for you, judging by um, the, uh, the what I'm seeing from sort of researching you online and uh, uh, in, in preparation for this. So, um, uh, I mean, how, how have things been since the publication of the book? Um, yeah, no, they've definitely been interesting. I think publishing a book is something that, I mean, even when you dream of being a, an author, you don't really know what that entails, especially when a, pandem a, pan a pandemic happens. And so it's um, it's definitely been a bit of a roller coaster, but I think that's true for everyone in 2020. But I'm really grateful for the good reception it's had and also the recognition. It's it's incredible that people see it. And I think that's all I could ask for. <laughs> So tell tell for the, for those who haven't had the chance to 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 look at this and uh, read it as yet. Do you want to give a sort of brief description of um of, of what it's about? Yes. So explaining humans is a book that I wrote. Um, that is you know what science can teach us about life, love, and relationships. But I've written it from a perspective of someone who is autistic, which is myself, and specifically from a younger age. I, um, I didn't really understand anything about humans to the point where I didn't know how to integrate with them and understand any of their behaviour. And so in my attempt to try and assemble this understanding, I used science and the different laws of, I guess, the elements that would then, for me, model the different human behaviours I saw. And so from this, I built my understanding from the ground up and it's in a memoir, um, which I now call Explaining Humans. Mm. Yeah, and and for those who haven't read it, it's a it's a really great read. Um, and you talk a lot about um, your uh, autism, um, which um, and you were diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder at the age of eight, and then um, uh, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder (ADHD), commonly known at um, twenty six. Um, and and with that in mind, in the, in the first paragraph of the book, um, you're, you're straight in there um, uh, talking about um, uh, how at the age of five, you felt like a stranger in your own species. And um, can you just just talk a little bit about what that feels like and what, what it's like to navigate the world in that way? Yeah, so it's quite interesting, actually, because when... Uh, when I describe this, I always try and um, there's different parts of <laughs> of being human that everyone can identify with and be like, oh, yeah, that's a bit of me. That's a bit of me. But it's the point where you don't even identify with that kind of association. So, for example, you can't even find your personality in, in characters on TV because to make that association is quite nuanced. And so for me to find my place, even when I couldn't identify people around me, it was quite alienating I was like well I feel like I'm missing out missing something this link that other people have that kind of glued everyone together and they had this little ecosystem that if someone didn't understand something everyone else would get it but for me it didn't really seem the case and so I was left um, um, not not being able to know what my hook was to understand mm. things so that was the thing it's getting started it's getting the engine running <laughs> to understand and for me that was quite hard but then you get used to it and then you realize that that's, you are all you need so <laughs> i was going to say i mean emotionally what is that like you know what is the experience of growing up in that way if that sort of from if i'm co reflecting you correctly that kind of feeling of sort of being on the outside or slightly disconnected from those around you i think when you develop uh empathy as you get older and just naturally um it can get a lot harder um, and that's one of the things that as I've noticed especially when um, when I was in when I was a teenager I that's when it became a lot harder because I was more aware of 
a I should be empathetic or I should be feeling this and also um I had empathy for people around me I want I wanted to fit in I wanted to be able to know what's what and I think when you're not aware of why you're different that that makes it a bit easier but if, if you know then you're like well you, you can't get out of it but you can <laughs> you just gotta make your own ecosystem so it's mm. hard but it's worth it <laughs> And and making your own ecosystem, I guess that's that's sort of pulls us into the conversation about using science in a way. Is that is that is that how you would sort of describe making your own ecosystem to kind of um, uh, explore and understand what's going on in order to create and build that empathy? Yeah, I guess so. Your ecosystem where you experiment and you try and um, observe what's going on, but ultimately, I think. As I've kind of, um, what's it called? Um, going back in retrospect, to call it an experiment was actually probably my coping mechanism itself to help me consider what was in front of me in quite an objective way. Because then, if you call it an experiment, you're like, okay, I'm in control of this. Let's try and see how I can um, fit in or X, Y, Z. Whereas if it's like a problem, then it becomes mm. very personal. And so I think by nature of just me, using science i was in a emotionally more i guess i don't know it just helped <laughs> mm, yeah I, I i i i like that um notion as you're talking about it's a it's a, um that um uh, you you're 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 um exploring that almost doing these kind of controlled trials almost to say well what 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 works and therefore well okay here's my yeah. hypothesis let's see if it works if it doesn't work okay then um uh try and understand why and then regroup and then try something else presumably it's that kind of sort of fairly iterative process which you go through yeah definitely definitely lots of iteration yes <laughs> <laughs> it's okay and um i mean the the so then you you clearly developed an interest in science and um uh and and you, you within the book you you explore you're quite wide ranging in your use of science and the the sort of what what you draw on is that um uh yeah where does that come from because you're you're you know you you're you're focused in one particular you 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 work in science right and but you draw on a kind of fairly broad range of different scientific disciplines within the book yeah, so that was actually on purpose um, because I love all aspects of science. And the more you dig deep into even one, one bit of science, the more you realise that you need to know all of them to then get a full picture of what you're studying. Even like cell lobology, you need to know the techniques that you're using. Why does fluorescence work? And, you know, what is the chemical changes that are going on for fluorescence to work? And so when you consider science and um, I always think of the wide ranging ones the different angles the different lenses in which you can look at something and observe it um, but also I wanted to draw the analogies between different fields of science because to me they are linked and they're taught separately and uh, very much so in schools which I I don't really like and I made the links myself which is great but I wanted other people to see the links and I think this whole point of um, specialising is, is good, but as long as you have an appreciation of how all science in as an ecosystem is, is bound together. But um, that's what I, yeah, and I love mm. more. I love reading about different parts of it and then seeing how they puzzle together. That's, that's my bad. Yeah, and, and, and so something of a sort of scientific polymath, I guess, in a, in a sense, sort of drawing upon all these sort of different disciplines and looking at sort of, how they interconnect with each other and um uh how i guess i guess what is often said is that the real insights are at the edges of these things and i'm just sort of trying to sort of bring this back to to the to the where we are today at the sort of impact conference and um uh, so this is a so so our our job is all about understanding people and uh, and how do we go mm. about understanding people and um uh, and 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 often it it feels as if we draw on within the industry we're drawing on quite a few different disciplines in order to do that and sometimes the interesting bits are at the fringes of these disciplines where they overlap between each other and if you is that do you, do you it sounds as if you've got a similar kind of um sense in 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 that way 
Oh, completely, yeah. It's one of the reasons why I actually did biochemistry, because it was the only degree that I saw that enabled the combination of all the three sciences, I mean, mm. physics, chemistry, or biology, and also the, it, the interface of these different sciences. That's where that's where it happens. You've got, I mean, ideally, you, you'd want biochemistry, physics. <laughs> you want them all together, because then at least mm. when you look at something or experiment, you can, like I say, do it, you can consider it from different angles, and I guess the values of different the different sciences and what they prioritize, I think it's very important, because they, they, they've each got their own character in a way. <laughs> I like to mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, um, I, I completely, um, I, I completely understand what you're saying, and I think it's, uh, I, 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 I feel that um, there is something lost by the academic specialization that happens, mm -hmm. um, and and perhaps as a practitioner, and you're a practitioner, right? You know, you're you're working in industry. Um, and you're, what you're able to do is to pull on all these different disciplines to help you understand this problem you've got in front of you. And I just wonder if, you know, if, 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 that, if you experience that in your day job as well, as a, um, uh, as a uh, you, you work as a biochemist, right? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so even for my PhD in bioinformatics, um, which I do now as a, I guess it's biochemistry bioinformatics, I okay. chose yeah. it because it incorporated lots of different sides of science, but also it didn't just focus on one protein. You could focus on many proteins and the patterns between them in biology, and I love that. And I think it's really good to specialise when, you know, it's like people like to be T-shaped. It's good to have like a general overall view but then to specialize in different things is very very powerful because then you can link them together of course mm. no one can know everything but it's mm. just knowing the complement between different things for then mm. you know how to act which is the key yes yes what do you do with it yes okay now we've understood it what, what do you then do with this and how do you yeah how do you do that's the next yeah. one isn't it yeah 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 so i i guess um one of the uh, questions which people might have here is a little bit around, um, well, uh, you've used science to understand people and, uh, you know, and as you say, sort of, you know, love and relationships and, and um, friendships and, and, the, and the book is a really great exploration of that um, and, uh, and, and living in this sort of very human world. I suppose the, the, one of the challenges might be, well, how far... Uh, can science really explain humans? Um, so understood that there you can use it in order to um, get so far. But do you do you do you see that? And and you've used it very successfully to unpick what's going on and to to help um, uh, facilitate empathy um, and empathic understanding of others. Um, um, but. What do you feel are the limitations of, of for you? You know, have you, have you, have you, what are the boundary conditions of this? Well, um, so um, funnily enough, I'm um, working on a second piece of work now that concerns this very question. And so that's, that's, um, you know, watch this space. But okay. ultimately, yeah, I'm not allowed to say anything. But ultimately, um, yeah, of, of course, there are limitations to science, because science is based on the theories and the laws that we have built and from what we know. But we don't, you know, there's so much that we don't know. And that's beautiful. But it also enables us to consider, for example, the gaps. And for example, things such as nuance, things such as um, AI anticipating the, you know, the needs of humans before humans do. And sometimes it's a good thing, but, but most of the time it's not. How is that question our evolution? We don't know. But there are limitations to science, and that's primarily based on this, you know, sometimes it can be very reductionist, and it can kind of force us to flatten others in order for it to be more coherent and modelable but that just makes it less real. So I think there's kind of a bit of a battle between the degrees of freedom of being human and also that of training algorithms to be more flexible. So it's a very interesting topic. And yeah, in short answer to your question, it's like, of course, science has limitations, much like the algorithm does, because even if you make the best algorithm for, for doing X, Y, Z, it probably won't be able to do a burpee or to, you know, or to do, or to, you know, write a book or to do an art it's very specialized mm. Mm. 
So, so where do you stand on the notion of sort of um, artificial, generalized artificial intelligence? You know, do you do you do you do you consider that one day we may come across um, uh, robots which, for all intents and purposes, seem human-like to us? We can't distinguish them from um, from, from 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 a regular person. I think you can give it a go. Though, I mean, there are many books that have written about this, like yeah. Ian McEwan's. Um, and machines like me, but at the end of the day, the main distinguisher is if you pour water on it, if you pour water on it, will it survive? So, mm. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, or, or will it just go up and smoke? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, yeah. yeah. But ultimately, okay. I understand your question, and I feel like, yeah, I mean, sometimes you could meet someone who's very human and very empathetic, and who just gets it and is on, who's always very adaptable to the whims and woes of of people and there mm. are algorithms that do that but then they have one or two functions it's really hard to change your objective function mm. there there and then unless told to do so and so as much as um, you can have a Fitbit that can tell you that you are running too fast or you're about to have a heart attack it doesn't stop you from having a heart attack. And so I think it's good for radaring what's happening, but it to enable it to have a, a judgment of its own ultimately is um, um, originated by coding from a human. Mm. I guess, and, and kind of linking some of these themes together a little bit is that, um, and, and thinking about some of the themes which we tackle within our industry, um, uh, we were, we're talking about the use of science to understand humans and how far you can go down that route. Um, uh, one of the ways in which um, within the market research industry that um, we understand humans is, is, is the act of asking somebody a question and, and receiving their answer. Um, I guess there's sometimes a bit of a tension in people's minds between a science-based approach of doing randomized control trials and deriving mm. um, insights about people from the answers which you get and then um, actually asking people to um, uh, explain themselves. Um, and I, I was curious as to where you sat on that um, because it's I, I think it's a sort of fairly live issue within within our industry. Um, it's not always articulated or crystallized, but I, I, I feel I, I work as a behavioral scientist within um, a market research agency. And so there is that sort of, well, how do we do this? You know, do we ask people questions? Do we um, do run a randomized control trial? Um, you know, what 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 would you say um, on that particular spectrum of, um, uh, of, of um, uh, challenge? I think it's good data versus bad data, and it's trusting that the people that you are surveying, providing that the questions that you are asking are as good as possible, they'll mm. give you the answer that they should do. And mm. sometimes it's not about people lying, but it's about mm. people projecting an answer that they think they know, but then maybe later on they'll be like, oh, actually, I should have done that one. Mm. That's okay. But I think that's just the limitation of just um, a one-hit wonder in time. It's like a snapshot in you know in, in in a series of gifts and so i feel like it's really um it's good to to have this snapshot in time but ultimately we are dynamic as people and by knowing the different women's and modes of it and modeling this kind of variance or distribution call it that and not calling it an error is actually mm. probably the first way to go is not being afraid of messy data but mm. making you know for example make it ask at different time points even though that's more work or asking mm. a wider range of people get the messy data as possible because then mm. you can see the patterns from a global point of view and perhaps that's a it's a good um, um that, that's a good sort of reminder for us in the world in which we inhabit where things are changing quite rapidly that yeah. sometimes sometimes you only have access to messy data or, or trying to make sense of a whole range of different data sets mm. is uh, is something which is the which is the challenge so um um so so returning to the uh, we've been talking about some of the sort of um uh, aspects of the book there clearly but but just returning to to the uh uh, to, to the topic of the book more directly. Um, what were your motivations for writing it? You know, what, what did you, what, what, what made you take on the um, 
Herculean task of actually um, uh, setting out to, to write something uh, of this magnitude? Um, well, I didn't. Well, I didn't really know it was of this magnitude when I wrote it. Um, I think it's. Um, so thank you. Um, when I wrote it, it wasn't something that I was conscious of creating mm. or writing. I did it just to survive. And I kind of, first of all, collected post-it notes, collected piles of objects, leaves, just anything that I could order mm. in sequence. But then to me, that was telling me something. And then when I learned to write, I then kind of communicated those different sequences into words and, and symbols. And then over time, you start to, it's your different languages that you go through to make this uh, a thing that can, people can understand. But ultimately, I wrote it for, for my mum, really, just to be like, thank you. Sorry, it was so, so you know, so it's, sorry, it was very confusing. And here's an explanation. And so, mm -hmm. That was um, for her, um, I guess, inadvertently, because I needed it to explain humans for myself, and I hoped it would explain me. And what did your mum say when you presented it to her? Oh, she loved it, and it was quite um, refreshing to hear that she said, oh, wow, I didn't know about this bit, and mm. even though she was there for all of it, so it really gave her that insider insight. Um, into the other side of what was going on and she said if I had this when I was when I was nine she'd be like it would change everything and it would change a lot of my assumptions I'd made as a mum because when you are a mum with a or a parent with an autistic child it's really hard to know what's going on behind the scenes mm -hmm. and there is a lot and I'm hoping this will clarify the message for a lot of carers. Mm. Do you feel your um aiming to sort of bust some maths, bust some myths about neurodiversity along, along the way um is it i i recognize that there's a there's a sort of as you say there's a really important role here in terms of um uh, helping carers to understand um is there a sort of wider agenda which you feel part of as well i think so it's i'm I, i'd like to I am an I am an advocate for neurodiversity, mm. but I'm not I'm I'm not going to be holding up placards in crowded streets shouting mm. about it because I can't I mean that gives me anxiety. So it's great that people can do that. Go, but I feel like the type of my advocacy will come out in my work and mm. such conferences um, such as this one, and also have the opportunities to research and communicate that through the written word. Or through articles and so for me that advocacy and kind of implementation of change will arise naturally I think hopefully from what I do but mm. I would like to think that people identify even with a small part of what I've written because that's how it all starts. Mm. Yeah, absolutely yeah and 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 empathy working the other way right and it, it's just sort of, yeah through understanding yeah works mm. both ways so what what's the what you 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 know, you're 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 a writer, and and you as we mentioned, you're 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 working um, in a um, uh, within industry. Um, uh, what what do you? How would you describe the value of um, uh, neurodiversity in the workplace? You know, what what's it? You know, is it, it what is it is what's it bringing in in a sense, or or is it just you know, is it is it something broader than that? It's uh, um, it's just. Perhaps just tell me, you know, how how would you how would you sort of think about that and answer that? So, um, so I like how you worded that question because it made me think of the answer that needs to be told. Because you're like, what does neurodiversity bring into the workplace? Well, currently, not as much as it could be, because mm. the workplace itself needs to adapt to the sensory and social needs of people who you know have or who are autistic or who have. Um, things that they need I mean they don't have to be diagnosed to, to be valid in the, what they need mm. but, but ultimately to communicate that so that people know to be empathetic to not be discriminated for example I'd hate to think that I wouldn't be involved in a project because people would think I'm unreliable because I like to have a because I have a panic attack you know three times a week I mean mm. to not discriminate but to be like oh yeah she has a panic attack but she's really good at creating heat maps and really good at analyzing xyz it's being objective and not, um, and for example, enable me to have the corner of the uh, the the chair at the corner of the room. 
it's really small sensory things that people are increasingly aware of. I'm hoping to kind of bridge this gap and communicate to people who are neurotypical so that they know how to help. But ultimately, neurodiversity brings so much to the workplace because if you want to have all these different adaptive strategies, then more the same won't cut it. And I'm currently reading about this because it's a bit of an untapped resource. So currently, not as much as it should. Great. And there's, there's, it's, it's not simply that um, we, we, we do this because it's the right thing to do, but there's also, as you say, there's huge value in having diversity in the workplace and, and considering all the different sorts of diversity um, uh, that, that can bring in terms of different perspectives. So if I'm reflecting back to you correctly, yeah, okay. Yeah, good. yeah, completely. The the um just just uh, just what thank you for that one one just I guess just we're we're, we're at pretty much on time but um uh, what would be the key thing which you would like people to take away with them after having read this book to ask the question how can I make people who are neurodiverse more comfortable at work how can I enable this human and that is brilliant because that's basically 70% of the way there. The fact that you're kind of, I wouldn't say stepping down because that implies that you're losing power. And I, people are obsessed with that apparently. But when you are um, working and you don't know what to do and you're challenged, you want to go in defensive mode. Oh, she's not that great anyway. You're like, hang on a minute. Let's just get off my high horse and realize what's going on here. This is a great human. She's struggling. How can I help her? Right. Okay, and and this is a this is a this is a great book to help you understand how and why, um, and uh, it, it certainly opened my eyes to to, to many issues. So um, so thank you, and uh, and look, thank you for for being here today. It's been a really interesting and illuminating conversation, and um, uh, so um, uh, my real gratitude and some I think some really interesting insights for um, for for the uh, market research industry uh, within that. So thank you so much, Camilla. Thank you. I hope I hope so. And yeah, thank you for having me on here. <laughs> thank you.